A few years ago, it was certainly possible to say with some confidence that religion is dead. Few people would probably feel quite so comfortable in making such an assumption now. Recent issues in the news, such as ISIS, the attacks on the Charlie Hebdo magazine in Paris in January 2015, the rise of religious nationalist movements across many countries in the world, all of these have left us with a conclusion that it is not so correct after all to pronounce the death of religion. Whether we like it or not, there is still a lot of religion going on in the world. The issue is not so much to worry about whether religion is alive or dead, but rather to get a better understanding of the many ways in which things we call religion are part of the world in which we live. Thus we can ask questions about the changing roles of religion in contemporary societies. For example, is there a process of secularization, of the decline of religion? Is this going on? And if so, is there any way of knowing where this will go, or perhaps end up? As societies develop, does religion become something different? Or do people do new things with religion? Is religion part of modernity, or is it opposed to it? What role does religion have in the process of globalization? And how is globalization itself spread and enhanced by religion? How do new media impact on religion? And again, vice versa. How are media themselves developed and changed by the influence of religious groups and religious practices? And how can we make sense of the particularities of the contemporary world in terms of the historical legacies of particular religions? How has the world we live in been shaped by particular religious ideas, by events in the past that were rooted in religious issues? Even if religion may have a lesser social role today in certain countries, much of the language we speak, the values we have, the laws we live by, and the institutions that structure our lives have all been impacted by religion and religions in so many different ways. And how does diversity at the international, the national, and the local levels create religious issues in the contemporary world? There is certainly a lot here to unpack, and so in this fairly introductory podcast, I will take some of the main highlights of these issues and give some initial pointers to where this may take us. First, I will look at secularization, then modernity, then globalization, then mediatization, new forms of religiosity, historical legacies of religion, diversity and multiculturalism, and nationalism. To take the first of these, secularization, can we talk about a process of secularization in contemporary societies, particularly in Western societies, such as in Europe and North America? Is it right to say that religion is losing its significance within such societies? There is certainly evidence to confirm that there is a decline in religious practice in a number of countries across Europe. And so, for example, church-going in England today is at a fraction of the levels seen a hundred years ago. The values that people live by are less obviously religious. Fewer people have regard to religion and church teaching in making decisions about most aspects of their lives. In this sense, religion has declined in social significance even though some churches and some elements of religion may still be thriving. Belief in God is often quite proportionally high, even though knowledge about specific Christian and other religious teachings may be quite low. One thing we must be careful about is to distinguish secularization from the ideology of secularism. Secularization is, if anything, a process where religion becomes less important across society. Secularism, on the other hand, is a viewpoint, a desire by individuals and groups to see religion lose its power. The atheist writer Richard Dawkins is a secularist who is prolific in his condemnation of religion and his attempt to persuade people to throw off the shackles of their religions. Such secularists may or may not be the products of the processes of secularization, and their ideas may or may not have an influence on whether or not a society becomes secularized. But secularization itself is not ideological. Like other social processes, it occurs according to the wider changes that are happening within the society, such as, for example, the changes of modernity. This is the second issue of religion in today's world, 
what is the relationship between religions and modernity? Is it right to assume that as modernity advances, then religion will inevitably decline? As I suggested at the beginning, this is not such a simple matter. Over the past century, the advance of modernity has produced mixed scenarios. Sometimes it appears that modernity is the enemy of religion, such as advocated in Marxist states such as the former Soviet Union, and of course, by Richard Dawkins. Whilst there are many instances where modernity is hand in hand with religious ideas. One small example of this is the sophisticated use of social media and the new technologies behind them by the Islamic State, and indeed a number of other successful religious groups here in the 21st century. Needless to say, the idea of modernity is itself very difficult to understand or define. Modernity is most likely something we associate with development, particularly technological and perhaps economic development. It is primarily seen to have come about through the advances in society and knowledge in Europe and North America, and so such contexts are taken as examples of modernity, perhaps to be emulated by others, if they wish to become modern. In contrast, a rejection of the complexities and social problems of modernity may also be put together with anti-Westernism, for example, in the political ideology of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in the 1970s, which attempted to put the clock back to a pre-modern time of year zero. It is almost impossible to pinpoint what is modernity. We may feel that we know it when we see it, but it is probably more accurate to say that it is a collection of various social issues that work very differently in different social contexts. If modernity is about a high level of technological advancement, then it can easily coexist with one or more significant religious groups within the society. If modernity is also associated with a certain set of political structures, for example, an organisation that we may call democratic, then again, religion may or may not be tangled up within the strands of political engagement that arise from such democracy. One small example, it is very hard to imagine that a US presidential candidate who was openly hostile to religion could be successfully elected to the office. The idea of modernity is very much mixed up with the idea of globalisation, the contemporary state of the world in which there is incredible change related to new technologies of communication, learning and travel. The advanced state of modernity has given rise to wave after wave of transformations that we associate with globalisation, movement of people and ideas across boundaries at a relentless pace. The internet, communicative technologies such as smartphones and tablets, international markets for jobs, services and goods, high levels of migration and refugees, economic tariffs and trade, aid and development, global economies of education, these all impact on the experience of globalisation. And within this, religious groups live across and within the forces of globalisation. In short, religion in today's world is globalised. In practice, this can mean many different things, ranging from interconnected diasporas and the spread of churches and religious groups across the globe. Globalisation is not a single experience or process. It works differently in diverse contexts. It is not solely the spread of American power, influence and economic might, nor is it the counterforces perhaps from China and other parts of Asia. One writer called Arjun Apadurai has used the idea of global scapes to encapsulate the experiences, flows and diversities of globalisation. That is, globalisation impacts on people through five particular scapes, which he calls, firstly, ethnoscapes, clusters of social identities based on shared culture or identity, Secondly, mediascapes, the flow of ideas and images through various media such as television and the internet. Thirdly, technoscapes, the ways in which technologies and knowledge, along with access to knowledge through education, plays out on a globalised level. Fourthly, financescapes, the flows of money and commerce, 
and the means by which such flows are controlled and regulated. And fifth, ideascapes, the flows of ideas across boundaries, often through social networks and particular media. In many respects, religious groups, identities and practices in themselves may be a further area of globalization, as a cluster of issues that mediate the impact and the experience of a globalized world in what could perhaps be called religionscapes. One of the tools through which the globalized experience and spread of religion usually occurs is through the power of media. That can be through traditional media channels, such as through television and print publishing, or through new media, such as the internet, blogging, and social media. Not only does the media allow for communication between individuals and groups, but also representation in traditional and also new forms, and education, or missionary work. There is no doubt that the ways in which people engage with the religious ideas and practices are changed through the new experiences of mediatization, through new media. As a small example, it is possible for a Muslim to use a phone app that will let them know the correct time of the day for their prayers, and even to show them the correct direction of Mecca for them to make their prayers towards. In many respects, media can either cause a decentralization of religion and in particular a decentralization of authority in religion, which may in turn lead to a reduction of the influence of centralized religious organizations such as churches, and thus it can inevitably encourage secularization, as we've discussed already. On the other hand, some media organizations can themselves exert strong influence and control on their followers through the media, such as through large televangelist TV-based churches. Media, and in particular new media, give opportunities for new and more immediate forms of communication, and so can have a considerable impact on the ways in which people experience and practice their religion. The emerging nature of the internet means that innovations in religion may come through the opportunities that emerge as the internet itself is developed. The emergence of new forms of religiosity certainly predate the rise of the internet. But it is also true that the easy availability of information and communication through the internet make it easy for the development and dissemination of new religious ideas. These can range from religions based on older religious traditions in newer contexts, such as Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism and so on, to religions that are based on fictional contexts, for example the Jedi Knights of the Star Wars films, the Matrix and so on and also religions that explore old forms of familiar religions, such as Rosicrucians, the Kabbalah, and so on. The most common idea of new religions is associated with controversies and violence, such as the cults of previous decades that led to the Jonestown massacres in the 1970s, or the suicides in the Heaven's Gate group associated with Halley's Comet in the 1990s. Not all new religions come about through forced conversions or brainwashing. Indeed, there are many reasons and causes for why and how people become involved with new and innovative religious ideas. In fact, it is most likely the case that new religiosity is a mainstream in many Western societies. In some vague and non-committal form, particularly in terms of exploration of and experimentation in things such as New Age or alternative spiritualities, such as yoga, crystals, tarot, or mindfulness. The changing nature of social relations, and the rapid advances in technology, population movements, careers and lifestyles, all provide fertile ground for new forms of religiosity to develop. Very often to provide religious experiences and practices that fit in with people's needs in a globalised world. Despite these changes, however, many secularized countries still have considerable historical religious legacies, in particular of Christian churches in Europe and North America. In terms of religious practices, the majority of UK residents are not churchgoers, but they live within a country that remains steeped in the Anglican Christianity that was a dominant political and religious force for many centuries. This legacy is shown in many ways, 
such as the role of the British monarch as head of the church and the involvement of Anglican bishops in the upper chamber of the UK Parliament, the House of Lords. But the legacy goes much deeper than this, since Christian values have very largely shaped the legal framework and the church itself still has considerable social influence as part of the wider civil society, and the special status of the Church of England has been claimed by some as encouraging the protection of all religions, minority as well as majority, and thus facilitating an acceptance of many forms of diversity within contemporary multicultural societies. There are indeed many causes of diversity within contemporary societies, and in many cases it is largely from another legacy, that of past colonialism, since, for example, in Britain the main minority ethnic communities are descendants of migrants from former British colonies in India, Pakistan and the Caribbean. Likewise in France, the North African French Burrs are largely from the former colony of Algeria. Alongside this, however, there are other new minorities and identities caused by more recent migrations, largely as a result of global work and educational opportunities from other parts of the world, such as China, the Philippines and the Arab world. Many minority groups define themselves in religious terms, either significantly or in part. Thus, there has been an increasing mobilisation of communities in Britain as Muslims first and foremost, rather than historically ethnic or national terms, such as South Asian, Pakistani or Kashmiri. Similarly, British people of Indian descent have increasingly emphasised a religious identity as Hindu and Sikh. In the case of British people of African-Caribbean descent, religious identities have not been so clearly exercised but this broad and diverse population is itself largely more Christian than the overall British population, and although it does not define itself purely in religious terms, its Christian identity, history and values are still important. There is no doubt that diversity within contemporary societies can often be a challenge, not least because minority groups are often, although not always, more economically disadvantaged and socially marginalised. Diversity needs to be effectively managed by the state, and this is related to the issue of national identity, that is, what makes up a contemporary diverse nation. The idea of national identity is an important part of all contemporary nation-states, and despite the rapid pace of change, internationalisation and globalisation are not likely to break down the significance of national units in the contemporary world. It is rare for states to use religion solely as the basis for national identity and mobilisation, but very often religion does have a significant role in some way or other. National identity is very often based on a range of issues, including a sense of shared ethnic identity or identities, a common history and values, and very often a sense of religious identity, including the historical legacy I have already mentioned. In some cases, modern nationalism has largely evolved a strong emphasis on religious issues, such as the growth of Hindu nationalism in India and the use of Islam as a focus for national identity in a number of Arab states, most notably perhaps in countries such as Iran and Saudi Arabia. In some cases, religion can be seen as a positive aspect of national identity, and a pluralism of religious groups can in itself be seen as contributing to a common national identity, as, for example, in Canadian multicultural policy. And so to sum up some of these wide-ranging issues, in order to understand the contemporary world, we need to take religion seriously. Although some may think of religion as an ancient or medieval relic of bygone times, religions are very often important elements of the contemporary world. They adapt, they change, they go through the structures, the processes, the experiences of the world in which we live. We need to recognise that religion and religions have an impact in many different ways. Thank you.